We're not going to talk about a particular disorder today. What we're going to be talking about is the difficulties with memory and how these might play out in terms of our understanding of, of disorders particularly as psychology is often very reliant on self-report, you know, and our experience of this. And it becomes even more important as we're talking about dissociative identity disorders, where there's often reports of child abuse and memories and what, what people are, will sometimes say are false memories. One of the difficulties of memory is that we have this, I have this belief that memory is sort of like taking a video of whatever happened and then playing it back verbatim later. And it's not like that. Memory is constructed and it's reconstructed. And most of us have memories that are not true. So for example, I have a memory of falling down on an escalator and getting my hair caught in the, you know, in the escalator. And it's a fairly, you know, at least moderately traumatic kind of memory in that when I get to a, an escalator, I will hesitate, not get on it for a couple of seconds, you know, long enough that, you know, that my family notices and giggles, but not long enough that most other people recognize. Is it true? Probably not. Um, my mother denies it. Um, and my memory is that this happened when I was about nine. I would assume that my mother would know. Um, there's also some very famous research by Elizabeth Loftus that looks at issues of memory, and she finds over and over and over again that memories do not seem to be the kind of valid tapes of our experience that we, that we believe. Now, let me just ask you a number of different kinds of questions. What did you have for dinner last Thursday night? What did you have for dinner on Thanksgiving? Is there a difference between those? And if you're like most of my students, you may have a real difficult time remembering what you had for dinner last Thursday. Probably last Thursday wasn't you know, something that stood out in any way for you, unless you always go out on Thursdays, um, or always, you know, Thursdays is always soup night, or it was your anniversary. On the other hand, I bet that most of you remember what you had for Thanksgiving dinner. And that's for two, two reasons. One is because you always have turkey and mashed potato and stuffing and um, pumpkin pie, you know. So it's, it's very easy to remember. Also, Thanksgiving is something that stands out for many of us. Um, for me, I go to my aunt's, you know, with about 35 people. It's one of the high points of my year. Um, so as we're thinking about memories, we might want to think, is it an accurate portrayal of events? Is it a story that helps us make sense of our life? And if, it's, if that's the case, then one of the things that we should be doing is thinking, is this a story that's useful? Is it inaccurate and baseless? Or, you know, perhaps it's inaccurate but representative of your basic life themes. So life is unsafe, unpredictable, out of control. Think about recovered memories. Um, early in our 
you know, in our work on child abuse, we would ask people about their memories of, of trauma or of child abuse. And the question has been, are we planting memories? And one of the things that's been clear is that memories, even of highly dramatic events, such as, you know, the, uh, the, the Challenger exploding, are often inaccurate. Sometimes our memories are inconsistent with our understanding of childhood memories. So for me, um, my memory of falling down on the escalator, I see myself and see myself at some distance. Probably not. Um, there seems to be some demand characteristics associated with, uh, with some kinds of requests for memories. Um, and I think while we see some symptom profiles that are associated with abuse, I think we need to be cautious about um, concluding that abuse occurred and even more importantly that it occurred as a result of something that a particular person did. Finally, one of the problems with abuse is that recantations are fairly common. Now, there are a number of reasons. One is you lied. The second is that perhaps they recanted because there was a lot of pressure on them to recant. We need to be aware of that. So I think, you know, as I'm thinking about, about memories, I want to be careful about how I do it and what, I'm, what I am saying. So there are a variety of costs and benefits. You know, the client wrongly believes or wrongly identifies a perpetrator and is believed, thus harming someone who's innocent. On the other hand, a client tells the truth but isn't believed, which means that that person is not validated, not believed, not protected and others can continue to be hurt. Finally, the client tells the truth and is believed, which means that the client is validated, believed, protected, and others are also protected. I want to pre prevent child abuse. I want to do anything I can to keep people safe. And in fact, if you look at the correlations between child abuse and psychological problems in general. If we were to wipe out child abuse tomorrow, I'd probably be out of a job. And I would think that that's good. I'd be happy to flip burgers at McDonald's for the rest of my life. Okay, maybe not happy, but I would be happy that child abuse was, was eradicated. There are a number of things that we can do. Certainly one thing we can do is educate children about unsafe situations and teach them to report abuse. I think maybe more importantly is help parents and support parents in identifying and using helpful disciplinary practices. When I talk to students, when I talk to parents, they often will report things that to me sound like abuse and don't recognize that there are other ways of handling, you know, handling problems. Generally, um, and you probably talked about this in general psych or in developmental psych, generally there are a variety of other kinds of things that are much more successful in changing people's behavior than either physically or emotionally or sexually abusive behaviors. I think parenting is a hard task and one of the things that we can do that can make it, make it easier is to provide support groups for parents. Other parents, maybe older parents, um, maybe um, you know, 
nurses or whatever, but find some support in order to help them through some of the dangerous and difficult parts of pain care. So what should you do now? Pay attention to your own memories. What do you, what you know and what you don't? And what kinds of mistakes do you make? We've also talked about meaning in a variety of different ways in this semester or this semester. And think about what kinds of meanings you you pull together. Because those meanings, those beliefs will be helpful as we're talking about depression in the next unit. And take care.